like I'm probably looking at it like, what does this say? Except now I'm going to start calling you Ruth Bader Martinez. Yes. There you go. I RBM. would take that moniker. We should so, start wearing costumes because we're going to be on. If, if Travis starts uploading videos, we're going to have to, you know, make ourselves look cute. When Travis starts uploading videos, this is happening. I know. Hey. I, I, I put everything that I had on the thing so you can decide. I think it's full now, though, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Because cool. um, there are they're very big files. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Let's do it. Chapter 2021. Okay. Okay. We are recording and. Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. I'm Alaric, and joining me, as always, are Joanna and Travis. We'll be talking about chapters 20 and 21 of The Golden Compass. Joanna, you want to tell us a little bit about these chapters? Absolutely. So as Yorick makes his way across the ice, Lyra waits impatiently for him to arrive at the palace in Svalbard. The bears prepare the combat ground with great care and ceremony, and Lyra watches as they give the same attention to Yofer Rankinson. Lyra feels sick when she realizes that Yorick will have had neither food nor rest for the last 24 hours and fears that she is unknowingly leading him to his death. When Yorick arrives at the palace, Yofer allows Lyra some time to speak with Yorick to encourage him to fight. Lyra quickly explains the urgency of the situation to Yorick. Impressed that Lyra was able to trick Yofer, Yorick gives her a new nickname, Lyra Silvertongue. Yofer and Yorick fight a long, brutal battle. Yorick feigns an injury to his paw, causing Yofer to let his guard down. Seeing this, Yorick makes his move, killing Yofer. Yorick is victorious and is restored to his place as the true king of the bears. He takes Lyra to a safe place where he has hidden Roger and they are reunited. After learning the fate of Lee Scoresby and the witches, Roger, Yorick, and Lyra go to the fortress where Lord Azrael is being held captive and where he continues to do experiments with dust. When they arrive at his room, Lord Azrael panics when he sees Lyra, but calms a bit when he sees that Roger is there with her. She tells Lord Azrael she knows he is her father and demands that he tell her the truth about dust. Lord Azriel tells Lyra that dust is what makes the alethiometer work. He tells her the story of Adam and Eve and explains that dust is another word for original sin or Adam and Eve's knowledge of themselves. He tells Lyra Mrs. Coulter thinks that cutting children's demons away might keep children free from sin. Lord Azriel realizes that when demons are cut away, a great burst of energy is released and believes that enough energy is released to create a doorway to another universe beyond the Aurora. Lyra tries to give Lord Azriel the alethiometer, but he refuses it. Utterly bewildered, Lyra sits speechless by the fire as she watches Lord Azriel leave the room. So the scene here of the the battle the mortal combat um was was something to behold and travis this was where we got to see that all the bears were holding mannequins that we discussed last week yes um and how he yofor had really made the bears into less than what we know the panzer bjorn to be he really diminished them as a as their entire culture in such a short amount of time, it seems. Yeah, he did. Um, again, you know, last week I talked about it a little bit. It, it reminds me a lot of uh, being in DC and uh, just how how much things change when um, a, a new leader shows up. Uh, the, you know, the entire culture uh, changes. You get a, a sea change of everyone trying to figure out how to uh, curry favor with the people in charge. And in this case, it looked like everyone, all the bears, decided to uh, abandon their traditions and their history, and um, you know, tr try to pretend to be more human. And I don't want to jump too far ahead and skip the great discussion about the battle, but it's clear that at the end of the battle as well, how the bears feel about the way that shift occurred and, and how they feel now that 
um, something, you know, the, it might, it's changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into it right now, but I, I can't wait till we get into that part. Hmm. The, the battle itself. So Yorick approaches, uh, he appears to be alone. Lyra runs to him or is allowed to run to him. Um, the the sort of thing about this moment is is Yofor Yofor is doing these sort of um, overblown warm ups. He's he they're bringing him things to hit. Uh, he's being you know he's she she notices things about his routine um, that don't stand out so much to her, but it feels very theatrical, like he's putting on quite a show. Um, it still terrifies her because he's he's monstrous and his the pageantry is is one thing, but his armor does look um, intimidating, mm-hmm. even though we know as the as the battle progresses that we'll find out that maybe isn't quite um, quite as well made or the quality of it is is a step down from, you know, someone who put a little bit of heart into it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you you noticed the um, theatric the, the theatric theatricality oh, yeah. of um, York's like pre-fight calisthenics. It reminded me of uh, you know, uh, gosh, uh, a, a guy like doing like uh, karate moves off to the side before yes. he gets into a fight with somebody <laughs> to try to intimidate them. And it's usually a guy who's you know not a fighter, <laughs> just like a, yeah yeah you know. Look at me, I'm tough. Well, and then they they bring him a dead walrus so he can like demolish it. Like it's any kind of practice. <laughs> like what? Yeah, <laughs> what even is that? It's just a. It has no armor. It's dead. No, it's just it's, laying, it's it's putting on a show, and like yeah. you can almost hear the other bears kind of like cheering at every at every swipe and every slash, and like really getting into this, you know, overly symbolic battle that's about to take place. That apparently does not happen very often. This is a little bit different from the way that the pants are born nor- normally do their business. Uh-huh. Um, so the, the battle commences and she, the, Lyra is so upset by how this is playing out. And before, before she, before they battle, um, she found herself crying. The tears froze uh, almost as soon as they formed, which she had to brush away painfully. She was so frightened. Bears who didn't cry couldn't understand what was happening to her. It was some human process, meaningless. Um, she's She cries a lot here during this battle, leading up to, during, and after. Um, she, you know, you can imagine that she can barely even see through the tears what, she, what she's, you know, I think she feels like he's, he's going to lose. Oh yeah, she's convinced that she she just drew her you know her pal in into a trap. That this was uh, this was his death. I mean, at, you know, at this point, she had no idea whether or not he was injured. She falls from this balloon. You know, Yorick somehow, whether he falls, you know, or, or what, is now as she knows from the lithiometer, running to get to her, could be injured is expending all of his energy just to get there. Mm -hmm. And she knows this. And so then I think, you know, I think all that emotion is building up because that pageantry, she realizes no one is doing anything for, for Yorick. So, you know, Eofer's getting pampered and he's getting kind of, you know, he's getting polished and he's getting uh, supported and encouraged and, you know, getting his ego stroked. So it kind of makes him feel whatever. And Yorick like literally comes bounding in and gets about two minutes with Lyra. And then he is, on the battleground right and 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 it starts and she everything she feels I, she feels it it's like it's her guilt you're travis and you were saying that's like her guilt from thinking she led him here and he's gonna perish yeah um real quick as an aside um joanna you're sharing your desktop oh that's correct you are i don't know what that means um, there is a little button in the Three. bottom right next to next to the heart. Okay. Three dots in a yep. row, right? Yeah. No, that it's one? the it's the one on the other side of that, uh, where you've got it's gray. It's got the gray circle. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to tap that. Stop sharing. Yep. Did it stop sharing? Not yet. Try it again. 
Stop. Shut there you up. go. Yay. Sorry, I don't even know what that meant. Sorry. I can cut that out. Well, you know, if you had, you know, porn open or something, we'd be able to see it. <laughs> Panzer Bjorn porn. Pa- Panzer, Panzer bjorn. Bjorn. Panzer bjorn. <laughs> Panzer bjorn. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I wish this was not going to be cut out. Don't cut that part out. Oh, I'm leaving it in. I'm going to find a way to keep that in. This episode should be called Panzer Porn. Pa- Panzer B P O R. Panzer B P O R. Porn. Panzer. Oh man, I don't even know how. We're going to come know. up with something. That, that's our new T-shirt idea for this episode. <laughs> uh, so and Panzer Porn. He uh, he coins silver tongue here, right uh, before the battle. How deft and wise and cool and chill a dude, a bear, is Yorick. He's like, no, 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 it's all good. I like what you, I like how you roll, he's and like, I'm going to start. Co- yeah, it's so <laughs> he's so sharp, and he he's going into this battle. You know, she of course Lyra is upset. She's human, and she can't see the deception. But Yorick already knows from just you would assume rolling up on the the palace that things have changed and that the bears are different and Yofer is a different kind of leader. He's not so much a bear as, as um, maybe trying to be something that he's not. That had to be something he knew the second he, he rolled up. Oh, absolutely. He's, he, he's a, he's a pretty sharp cookie. Yeah. I mean, if we saw, you know, we saw it, and and Lyra saw it uh, when she first got to the to the palace, and she smelled everything. So with his bear senses, just imagine how horrific that place has got to be for him. Oh sure, it'd be a horror show. Yeah, yeah. They cleared the little battleground, but that's oh. not hiding what else is going on there. Yeah, um, that's why the first thing he says when he when when you know he gets in and he's uh, announcing his terms of battle to the the bears, you're tearing this down. I, mm-hmm. If I win, this whole joint is coming down around uh, our ears because it's, it's ridiculous. Sure. And, whole... and literature has told us that the more polished, the more beautiful, the more carefully maintained the armor or the armaments, mm-hmm. it always means that there is a significant weakness somewhere. It's Rocky Four. This is it's... this is the Drago lab versus Rocky training in the barn. Sure, it's the Death Star, you know. Yeah. It's you know, it's all these things that are like awe inspiring, but there's always some weakness, and he seems to have dialed in on that. He mm-hmm. knows already, you know, it's almost like a game of chess. Mm-hmm. He sort of has is already seeing the steps in this battle he's going to need to take in order to win, knowing that he's a smaller bear, he's not as strong, um, but he's cunning. Right. Right. What uh what this reminded me of, uh uh, you know, especially in honor of today's date, it's reminded me of Worf um, fighting Gowron. You know, sure, in their generation, yeah. this is totally nice. that scene. Um, mm-hmm. Not, uh, not Gowron. Um, oh, what was that guy's name? Uh, um, I was, you know, I, I literally just watched that episode recently. Larson Bator's uh, brother. Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, but, yeah. I know it's going deep. I know it's a slightly off topic, but um... this is on topic. Trev. <laughs> yeah. Anytime that Star Trek comes into play, it is on topic. Uh, so the battle is is commencing. Lyra is freaking out because uh, Yurik has a significant gash in his stomach. Mm-hmm. He's bleeding. It, it's she notices that he's bleeding quite a bit. He's pretty beat up. He's taking hits. But Yofer's armor looks worse. His his protection is little by little being being removed, perhaps. But Yurik is still taking a significant beating. He's getting smashed around pretty bad. Yeah, he was getting smashed around, but he's methodically taking apart uh, Yofer. Mm-hmm. Now, well, especially thing. exposing his belly, like ripping yep. apart the 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 um, chain mail of his belly. Mm-hmm. He does it so easily. It's like, what did they use? Was it literally gold? Like something that would be so impractical in battle, but something that he was like, Oh, I want it to look good. Or, or he's never going to, he's never going to get one hit in or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like he rips right through it. And it's just, he is, he exposes the, his underbelly immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's a bit that, that, that really um, stood out to me. Uh, 
Yofra at some one point is like raining blows down onto um, Yorick's back. But they're careful to, but uh, Pullman was careful earlier in the uh, scene to to make to to make clear that all of Yofra's arm, I, I'm sorry, all of Yorick's armor is on his back. Yes. He did not so, have anything on his belly, right? right? That's what she she notices that about. She's like, "Oh, poor poor Yurik has no armor on his stomach." Uh-huh. Uh, and he and he he gets injured there. I mean, he does take some take some swipes there on his belly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, but of course, Yurik seems to know what he's doing and he starts to feign a significant injury to uh, his paw. His paw sound it sounds cuter than what it is, but his paw his mm-hmm. foot it's not his mm-hmm. foot his paw uh and he's favoring it significantly so much so that yofor is is striking him and and fighting him knowing that that is a weakness but little by little yurik is backing himself up to find purchase somewhere to strike and strike he does and joanna you mentioned here in your notes uh bloody end <laughs> and man, is that a bloody end for a book for kids or what? God. Holy God. <laughs> like his tongue he knocks his jaw around. off. Yeah. He swipes his jaw. Boom. No jaw. Tongue lolling around. And then he rips open his throat. From stem to stern. And then reaches in, cuts open his stomach and eats his heart. This is all in the span of like a paragraph and a half. <laughs> you know, the, the title of this, uh, this, this chapter was so fitting because this was totally a fatality. Yes, of course right. it was. Right. Yeah. This is like a fin. He did a finish him move. <laughs> he did. Uh, and then some, it was like, he finished him. He knocked off his jaw. He slits his throat and then he bites his throat. And I think he seems to pull out his esophagus or something. Mm-hmm. And then that would be when the, you know, Fatality would pop up. Then he rips <laughs> open his stomach and eats his heart. Yeah, that's when that little guy pops up in the corner and is like, oopsie. <laughs> <laughs> but then the bad assery, is that a word? The bad yeah, assery no, continues no. Yeah. when he's eaten the heart and then he goes, Bears! Yes. Who is your king? I'm like, you are! Like, I'm like screaming <laughs> from my armchair. Yeah. Rex my king. I mean, it was so so amazing i was so riled up when he did that it was fantastic yeah yeah that was awesome that was he, awesome and he uh, he must you know running for however 24 hours or however long he ran he must have been thinking of all the things he was going to tear down the second he w- either won or not but if he won all the things he says in this sort of part of the pageantry of it was like if he dies we'll we'll tear him limb from limb and we'll stick him and all over these you know whatever and and Yurik's like, if I win, you'll tear all this down. And they sort of go back and forth with some, you know, some big talk, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I really did love that he's you know he's holding the you know hot, the steaming heart of his enemy and like calling upon the bears to destroy what you know what he hath wrought. Good stuff. I just love that that and that didn't phase Lyra at all. Like she was not phased by the fact that her buddy just gutted this guy that she just had conversations with and then ate his heart. Not phased. She must have just been, st- it must have been st- just stunned by, th- by what she saw, especially yeah. with that expectation. She's sobbing, you know, right. knowing that she really thinks that Yofor's about to strike the death blow mm-hmm. at that moment. Um, And then it's like, oh, no, no, oh, it's, uh, oh, something else happened. And, oh, we won. You know, it's kind of, there's a real surprise and a shock, I think, that she must have experienced. Um, You know, and and shortly thereafter, someone's like, oh, here, eat these seal kidneys. And she's like, okay. (laughs) um, (laughs) And they're delicious. And they're delicious. And the buttery blubber and all that stuff. I mean, she's like, hey, you know, she might as well just start living as a bear. Yeah, Yeah. when in Rome. When in Rome, man. Well, that's Lyra, right? Like, she goes to, to live with Egyptians. She becomes Egyptian. Yes. She goes to the bears. She becomes a bear. Yeah, she really does assimilate. And she's like, okay, if, if this is what we're doing, we're doing it. And she doesn't do anything half-ass. I think we keep saying that. She doesn't do anything half-ass. Everything yeah. is, is full-ass. And that's just like <laughs> um, Pan, right? And, yeah. and the, the little, uh, any any child's demon, how it flits back and forth and she changes shape for the, for the situation. That's what I, Lyra does. I love how hard Pan was working to comfort her and also 
had to be invisible. Mm-hmm. He was like his smallest form and he's in her pocket and he's nibbling her finger. I just love how how dialed in Pan is on how to comfort her and doing everything he can in the form that he's in while still hiding. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was really touching. Um, and he can't even see what's going on. You know, right. he's he's in her pocket hiding. I wonder how they learn how to do that. Cause like you think about a, you know, you, you've both got kids. So you've, you've gone into the, the self soothing phase and you want them to, to figure out how to make themselves feel better. Mm-hmm. You know, I wonder how the, the demon figures out uh, how to soothe its, its, its person. Well, I mean, let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Like as a, as a, a kid, when you're self soothing, you know, I think thumb sucking is is something. Um, mm-hmm. A a, uh, a stuffed animal, um, a night light, like all these little things that you use to comfort yourself when you're a child. That's all wrapped up into like a little living creature. Um, you know, pan can generate light, warmth, uh, mm-hmm. comfort. Um, uh, can talk and whisper and all those things that like even more so than what you know, you can do with, with things that are not alive, but you know, pets are another thing that are, are help soothe young kids. You know, I've seen, um, you know, dogs and cats are very helpful for kids, but she's, uh, or, you know, pan has all those things and more and he's part yeah. of, you know, he's, you know, a, a stuffed animal has no awareness of what a kid needs. The mm-hmm. kid, the kid has to dictate everything. So mm-hmm. if there was a more of a push and pull between the two, that could be really, you know, I, I can't imagine a child needing any comfort that has a demon. I guess that's why Lyra was so offended when Mrs. Coulter suggested that uh, Pan would be a pet. Right. right. With the, uh, after the intercision. It offended me. And I don't yeah. even have a demon. You know, it's like I was offended for the two of them mm-hmm. and all all demon kind. <laughs> Is that something? I don't know. I don't think the demons like organize and have their own thing. Like, you know, uh, so he, they tear down, they start to tear down immediately start just like ripping apart the palace and throwing stuff in, you know, down off the cliffs. And Lyra's like, um, um, there's people in there, you know, can we get those out first? And, you know, she has to get, you know, Yurik's attention and, and luckily they're able to get the people out. But, you know, it's been a while since I've read this book. But in my head, reading this, I was like, I forgot that that Asriel wasn't actually there. He Same. was somewhere else. Right. Yeah. I was like, oh, right. He's not here. He's 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 like somewhere within their domain, but he's not specifically at the palace. The princess is in another castle. Right. <laughs> and it struck me because, you know, of course, he's a very important prisoner. Um, someone that would carry a little more weight than just, you know, this this poor, you know, schlub that that Lyra had a conversation with that was, you know, cranky about, you know, how he was wronged by the university system or whatever. Uh, I, I I appreciate that, but she, you know, before we get to Lord Asriel, again, I realized he, oh, he's not here. Um, we get a lot of information about Lee Scores being the witches and what happened with them uh-huh. because. Hello, Roger shows up and he was with Yurik. Thank uh-huh. goodness, because I was kind of worried about that little guy, but I'm glad that they ended up together. Um, but, you know, Roger, imagine he's, he was riding a very determined bear for a whole day. A day. That, ha- that could not have been easy. Yeah. And then he had to wait. Like Yorick oh. was like, you've oh, got you to stay here. <laughs> here. Yeah, you wait here. I'll go and I'll come right back. You know, and wherever that was, wherever that was. It's like, was he just and, and like where? Like, it wasn't it couldn't have been like really warm or comfortable no. or he's out in the middle of Svalbard somewhere. Yeah, you know, Pullman's got to rolls right up in some snow to go to sleep. You know, there's nothing warm around right. here. It's like, oh, hey, let me pull this snow up here and go to sleep. It's like, man. Right. But yeah, I, I want Pullman to write the story of uh, Roger just hanging out in the in the snow for a while. Because what did he do? Like that he could be that... an appendix of some kind, like you yeah. know, Rod, Roger's Day or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he like makes a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a cliff gas, like a kid cliff gas that he meets uh, <laughs> while the rest of them are off fighting. Uh, that, I can, you know what? Let's oh, do this. We're still working on our fanfic, right? That's right. right. 
That's right. right. That could be our, our well, no, it's not, he's a kid, so it can't be our Panzer Pjorn, Torn. Um, no. But, you know, maybe something else. Uh, I'll cut that out. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I, I know that we're going to move on to Lord Azrael, but I wanted to just make a note of something you had said earlier, which was how the bears, you know, with the things that were shifting and there and how they like, you know, at, at one point weren't really sure they were just kind of doing what's in fashion. But as soon as Yorick won and said, take it down, every bear was on it. I mean, and not, question. yeah. And not just on it because, oh, he told us to like, I love what it says in here. It said each bear knew what they must do. Um, they were Yorick's bears now and true bears, not uncertain semi-humans conscience only of a torturing inferiority. And then they swarm and they start to, so like they rediscover, they remember who they are and they just take it all down. And I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. They didn't memory. want to be living like that. Like there, there has to have been a big part of them were like, I, we, we have to live like this because our King wants us to live like this, but they don't, they don't want to live like that. It was kind They're of bears. Like, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like the, like with, with when like Killmonger takes over, like, yeah. in, you, do you know what I mean? Like, sure. in, it's like, and they're following, you know, a quay is following, even though it's not what she, you know, in her because heart it's wants her to duty. do, but it's her duty to do uh -huh. it. And, and they're the same way. Like they are, honorable and they're noble and they need to follow their king even if the king is you know a doofus and I mean, he is they, they, and the mannequins too they were like oh you know like felt stupid having yeah. them you know yeah. and i wonder was, what yorick thought when he came running through and everybody had a doll that was when so when yofor was prepping to fight he didn't have his mannequin with him right. and that's when the ones that ho had the mannequins were kind of like are we still doing this like you know <laughs> there was kind of a moment where like are we still doing the mannequin thing because he doesn't have his mm -hmm. you know i thought that was really kind of striking too uh, but you're right they just they're immediately shed that that human patina that had been put on them and they they sort of were restored Mm -hmm. yeah. Immediately, you're so quickly. They're it like, was. "Okay, I'm ready. Let's do this." Yeah, I really appreciated that. And there seems to be kind of like bear wise wise bears, um, you know, studied bears, bears that know the history and things like that, which I, I thought was was great. Shaw um, bears. Sh what? Shaw bears. Shaw bears like shaman. Like shaman. Oh, I like that. Shaw yeah. bears. Oh, I like, I'm good with that. So we hear a little bit about what Lee and the witches went through and, and um, there's some elaboration on what happened. We don't know everything that happened, but we knew, do know that the witches were not just, the witches end up fighting something else, right? More witches. Yeah, right. I was like, they're fighting another witch clan and then yes. and they're not exactly sure why the other clan is attacking were they working for the oblation right. board is right. this just a clan disagreement right so they don't really it's, it's unclear at, right now uh, as to how you know and, and she's gone and there's like no real they don't know i can't remember if, if um with the alethiometer if if lyra tries to, to learn what happens I, I can't remember if she does or not but they had like she's gone like seraphina has gone all the other witches are gone mm-hmm and then Lee Scoresby does that too. But Lee Scoresby, uh, I'm I'm a little uh, surprised that Lee Scoresby is uh, capable of fighting fighting witches. Like witches are some something that is within the, you know, his uh, they're in his wheelhouse. Yeah, you know, I, you can picture picture him like in an action movie. Like he definitely had two guns. Oh, standing in there with like two guns, and he goes witches get stitches or something like that you know <laughs> and like that's his thing and he just starts like boom 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 uh you know th there's some sort of heroic moment that we we it happens off camera we don't get that to see it too. but that would be it for me but that's yeah like, that's his texas moment yes so yeah. that is his texas moment right it's, there i mean it's a pew pew moment yeah travis my travis loves the alamo he loves anything that is like the alamo he loves when he loves helms deep like he just loves when it's like the few against the many and that somehow the few, you know, sort of prevail. And this is like, although in uh, the Alamo, they didn't really prevail. It's like uh, not Davy Crockett, but Sam Bowie, who was there? Sam Bowie? Yeah, Davy Crockett was there. Davy Crockett was there. I mean, like, mm -hmm. yeah, these like these like historical, like, you know, yeah, you know, 
this is where we make our stand kind of thing. But he's mm. in a balloon, you know, he it's is. not quite, it's not like he's in a fortress. Right. Uh, this is where so we make kind our of, float. Yeah, this is where we make our float. Um, <laughs> but he's alive. He survived and he fought. And not that he won, but at least to a stalemate, he didn't mm-hmm. die. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're sort of getting all this information piecemeal, but it's, it's, uh, it sounds like it was quite an exciting battle that we missed. We got yeah. to see a pretty exciting battle ourselves, but we did miss a pretty cool battle that I would have liked to have seen. Yeah. Agreed. Maybe we'll see it in the show. I don't know. Whether do you think they'll touch on that in the show? There's know. enough there. There's enough description to show something. Yeah. yeah. Or we'll get it in our um, Roger's Day Off story. Mm-hmm. Roger's Day's Day Off and then like a lot of Lee Scoresby winking and shooting guns. Exactly. Come here, witches. You're getting stitches. <laughs> Wink. That's another shirt. Witches get stitches with like knee sports. <laughs> uh, we got, oh man, I wish I had any, any kind of graphic design I, skill. Oh man. I got z- like negative zero, if that's yeah. possible. The square root of negative one. That's me. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so this is tremendously exciting, of course. Um, so we're, we're able to find out a little bit more about Lord Asriel and where he is. And immediately we set off to see him. Lyra wants to give him the the alethiometer. She's still very driven by this, this mission, this task, this quest to give him the alethiometer. He is not housed with the bears. He is housed a place that his choosing, they built him an elaborate facility with um uh scientific equipment and this was i don't know if you could pick this up but this is the first time that everything that lord asriel has and the things that he is using to study dust and what he's going to do it's referred to as his materials and i was wondering whether that stood out to you as are you know if it if it is or if it isn't these are some of his dark materials the things that he's using these tests about dust the things that they're learning and the things that are testing and trying to use and what they're attempting to do is this some of the dark materials i will admit i did not think of that i did not make that connection before yeah i didn't that was a good catch i didn't i didn't see that i could have read too much into it it's, it's it's literally one of the few times the word materials even appears in this mm-hmm. book, and it felt like it was a little a little kernel that was dropped. Um, but again, we haven't finished the book, so I'm not sure what these materials are and if they are dark indeed. But it's it struck me. I just wanted mm-hmm. to mention that. Uh, so the they travel up to see Lord Asriel, and um, Lyra rides another bear that um, maybe isn't as comfortable as Yurik because he's a little harder harder to ride. But they get up and they go to see Lord Asriel. And they are greeted at the door by his manservant. He's got a manservant. He's got he's a manservant. He's in prison. Yeah. He is, he's, he's, he's exiled. So, yeah, I would have been bitter if I were Lyra and I rolled up into the house. I'm here to rescue what? <laughs> you know? Look at this place. No. Yeah, it's like real fancy. It's fully decked out with fancy chairs and nice light and it's warm. He's got hot bath water. Who knows how they've got that? He's got it's, glass. Oh, yeah. Which it's, is apparently a big deal. It is I can't imagine voice. bears blowing glass. No way. No, this yeah. is tremendous. Mm-hmm. And like all the things he got had to have been, you know, fetched and brought back to him in order mm-hmm. for him to have this kind of accommodation. So Lyra sees Lord Asriel. This is sort of the move into the next chapter here. And Lord Asriel freaks out. Flips out. Flips out. Like, you're not supposed to be here. And she's like, Ugh. she's, I think, equal parts stunned and maybe a little bit pissed by it all. Oh, yeah. Like, what the what the H um, is going on here? Like, uh-huh. wh- why is this happening? 
Uh, but he loses it, but only for a brief moment until Roger rolls in. Mm-hmm. And then whether it's because there's another person there and he needs to get control of himself or of something else that he is sensing, he comes way down pretty quick. Yeah. But uh, Lyra definitely expresses that, that she was angry a little later um, when she's sitting down with him. And she's like, you know, I came all this way. I went through all these things and you didn't even say thank you. You know, yes. I came here with the alethiometer for you. Risk life and limb, and all I get is you flipping out on me. Yeah, and she could. She listed several, you know, people or things that loved her uh-huh. that she believed loved her, and she loved them. And he's her actual father, and she does not feel any love for him, and frankly, doesn't feel a lot of love for from him or for him. Uh-huh. She's kind of like, you know what? Screw this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She's, I mean, she's so baller. She's like, (laughs) I mean, she's so, you know, she's ready to like literally leave. It's like, I'm out of here. Peace out. You know, and just fling the, you know, fling the alethiometer at him, you know, and then like flip the table over and run out the front door. She's done with this. York, take me home, sir. (laughs) She lists out, she recaps the entire book of the golden compass mm-hmm. at one point where she's like, I did this. I got captured by the gobblers. I blah, 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 blah. all the things she went through to get to this place at this moment to deliver something. She believed that he wanted her to bring to him. And this is the appreciation that she gets for all that. She's a kid. Mm-hmm. And also, by the way, his daughter, if it was yeah. just any random kid, I would still expect a better you know, a better welcome than that. And she also drops that on him and he's like, yes. Yeah, so yeah, whatever. Yeah. He's very hard. Worst. He's the well, worst. I mean, it says, so, I mean, I mean, we kind of move through that pretty quickly, but like the fact that he Sorry. was even able to get stuff from the bears. Yeah. I love the, like I, there's a part in here where it says that, um, the bears had never met anything quite like Lord Azrael's own haughty and imperious nature. Mm-hmm. Not any one, anything. Anything. Right? So, like, he is not this a completely witch, for- not a Yeah, human. nothing yeah. has ever come up against them with such haughty, like, entitled, like, you know, he challenges Yofer and he wins. He argues because Yofer wants to be a human yeah. and he's a poor bear, let alone human bear and so Azrael just demolishes him with you know and this is how he gets this is how he gets his way he's like this isn't enough I need this I want that and so he's building all of these things and and the bears just are just kind of giving it to him because Yofer does and so I mean that in and of itself like he is just this force of nature and his response to her is so horrible like we're saying he flips out but specifically he says no no why are you here i didn't send for you like what here's the thing though about that and i i I did want to touch on that those exact words sound like he's afraid like i i read that as he was afraid when he saw her yes and I want to know why. What, I, don't why? Know. She, I don't think she read it that way. Right. But she you're definitely right. didn't. She doesn't read that way, but you're right. He's terrified. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's he, clutching. He, he's... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, he doesn't want to see her. He's right. freaked out that it's her. And like, you're not, you shouldn't be here in a way that we don't quite understand. But it's, he's not, ha- he's, it's not that he's not happy to see her in the sense that you would normally say you're not happy to see one, but he, de- he doesn't want her to be the one that he sees at this moment. He does not want her in that space. Wait. And... Oh, well, and, yeah. Oh, Sorry. no, no, please. No, well, continue. it's the same response with Mrs. Coulter. When Mrs. Yeah. Coulter walks in and she sees Lyra there with the, you know, guillotine ready to drop, she clutches the chair. He's clutching the mantle. Like, yeah. These people need some, I don't know, smell and salts because they faint. You know, they, they clutch. Yeah. They're all like, oh, my pearls. But yeah, the vapors. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, it, 
so we get that. Like we see that. Yeah. We're told that, but Lyra doesn't see it. So it is, you're reading it, I think, the right way. She is also reading it the way that anybody would read it because you wouldn't notice that when somebody is screaming at you. Oh, right. Yeah. Like, no, no, get out. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm you're right. That he is a third person omniscient, you know? Yes, right. <laughs> rather, than, <laughs> rather than the, the, the first person, oh my God, why is he in my face? You know? Yeah. I mean, he he's says, terrified for her. Yeah. He says to her, after they've sort of gotten over this hump, he says, you know, she's like asking him some pretty innocuous questions. He's like, I don't think I want to be interrogated and condemned by an insolent child. I want to hear what you've seen and done on the way here. She's like, I brought you the bloody alethiometer, didn't I? She is like stepping to him. She's not putting up with his, you know what? Right. And like, this is when she dresses him down and you're, she doesn't read the, that, possible anguish of him seeing her he doesn't want to see doesn't want to see her in that way but once they've sort of settled into a conversation she's still like fronting to him like what this is Jesus. this is a lyra who has seen some stuff like she's this isn't the lyra things. who's pretended to be in wars in oxford she's past the pretend pre pretense yes. she is now the lyra who has been kidnapped who has almost had her soul removed mm -hmm. who has flown with witches i mean his jaw is knocked off and watch the jaw eaten. get knocked yeah, yeah she's, she's like she's been after kidnapped yesterday i don't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you ain't yeah. no big thing exactly yeah. Sit down. yeah exactly yeah. Right. she basically becomes joanna <laughs> <laughs> her it's... adventures turned her into joanna you know has She's always been she's evolving and evolving and evolving as a character, as as the protagonist of this story. Is this as close? I mean, it's very late in the book, obviously, but is this the most defining moment for her when she sees him and doesn't cower before him? The the one per, maybe the two people that could make her cower would be Azriel and Mrs. Coulter at this point. And she is she does not back down from him. And he maybe is the was maybe the last person on the list because Mrs. Coulter has been checked off that list. Now, now we're down monkey. to the last person and like, the monkey. The yeah. monkey. If she the last she's person on that list and Stel Murray or whatever. But she she has clearly stepped fully into the role of a leader and a, and a, a sort of a a champion for whatever cause she thinks that she's, you know, whatever, whatever mission or quest that she's on. And she isn't going to take anything from anybody anymore. She's fully formed now in a way. And the but way she uses the lasiometer too. You know what? I don't know that that's the case. I almost feel like part of her anger is that, um, Azriel took away her mission. Like she felt like her mission was to save her father mm -hmm. and then to go on adventures with him. Mm-hmm. And then she gets in there and he's like, I don't want to see you. So her first thought is, you know, why am I here then? Why did I do this? You know, I, obviously I don't need to rescue you. You're, you're, you're living here in a uh, sweet pad and you don't even want the alethiometer that I went all this way to bring you. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly you don't want me here. So clearly you don't want me to go on, on adventures with you. Why am I here? You know, you've, uh, I had a mission and now it's gone. And I she, think it's more than just the mission too. I think it's, it's that she now has, when she first encounters Lord Azrael, she doesn't have anyone in her life. Even Roger, who is like the most, the closest person for her at Jordan mm -hmm. College. She doesn't have a close relationship with anyone. And so she defers to Azrael and to Mrs. Coulter at some point, like, just because she's yearning, she's trying to, you know, have a relationship. Remember early, early back, she was like, maybe Mrs. Coulter and Lord Azrael will get married and maybe I can have, like she was trying to form these things mm. in her, in her mind, but now she has them. You know, she, Ma Costa loves her. Farder Coram loves her. Yorick, he loves her. Mm -hmm. In, what, in whatever way that a bear can do that, he loves her and she loves them. And it's the first time, I think, in her life that she's had that. And now when she sees him, she's like, I don't need you. Mm -hmm. yep. You don't aren't. You know, I have all of these people on my side. All these people have my back. And again, then you ain't no big like, you ain't no big thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. 
So I think that's part of it. I think it's more than just that she, she's not fully formed, but she's coming to her own. It's more than the mission, but it's because, you know, she got there because of these people. Mm -hmm. They helped to create that mm -hmm. for her. Yeah. And as much as she's independent and she doesn't need anyone, she is stronger for the people that have surrounded her up to this point. Mm -hmm. She's she's leaned on people in a way that maybe she didn't when she was at Jordan mm -hmm. and has had quite a bit of success by trusting other people. Yeah, I mean, at one point she misses Ma Costa's strong arms. I think they call it like her strong arms. Mm -hmm. Like she just wants to lay in them, mm -hmm. you know? And that is such a sweet thing for Lyra, you know, who is like, I don't need anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they sit, and after everyone's calmed down a little bit, she says, yo, what's dust? And here comes Captain Exposition. Basil Exposition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to take us down that road, Travis, about dust? It's uh, an elementary particle uh, identified by a Russian named uh, Makarov, I believe. Uh, Rus Rusikov. Rusikov. Rusikov, excuse me. I don't know where Makarov came from. Um, Rusikov. A Makarov and... cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, hey, oh, um, God, sorry. <laughs> and basically it's original sin. It uh, boils down to uh, the, the church believes that it's original sin. They, they tortured, I'm sorry. They um, had an exorcism in the lab of Rusikov and which, which I'm really interested in. I yes. really want to know what uh, a scientific exorcism was like in a world with demons. Yes. And also uh, an exorcism and an inquisition. Yeah. So there's a lot of mental imagery I here. About what that. I did not expect that. The red robes running off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it something that uh, is kind of terrifying in a way that, you know, you sort of discover something and you bring it and say, look what I've discovered. And next thing you know, you're being like, you know, tortured. And, and, and you know, they're, they're certainly, they're scared of whatever this is. Is Rusikov the Galileo of this world? Was there a Galileo? Yeah, there could have, certainly it could have been a Galileo. Would, There's uh, Had there been, um, Lord Azrael would have referenced him, mm -hmm. you know? So... I just wonder if, if that's who he is, but, uh, but yeah, like, you know, going, going back to, to, to the exorcism and possession in a world where we know that demons are a thing mm -hmm. that they see them on a regular basis. How are you possessed by them? You know, what does that look like? I want so much more of that. Or, or is that even a thing? And they have, they've just made it up as an excuse to uh you know torture this guy and get him to uh recant his discovery right mm -hmm. really interesting to me so the the part of this discussion about original sin brings us to uh lyra fetching a bible and giving it to lord asriel and lord asriel reading from the bible and this is essentially our bible the three of us, our Bible, the Bible that exists in our world right. with a very extremely subtle difference, which is the existence of demons. The demons are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, it's same, same, same words, essentially same Adam and Eve story. Adam and Eve is in this book and they had demons, demons that did not settle demons that were able to bounce around a little bit. And when tempted by the serpent and when the fruit is consumed, their demons settled and they were aware of themselves and they had shame for the first time. Um, and it, it's interesting because shame is also brought up a little bit in when Roger and Lyra are going to take a bath. There's yep. just a little bit of that hinted at where they many times had swam naked but this was different because they were in a bath there's a little a little touch there mm -hmm. uh, but so we're getting passages from our bible with a sw slight twist and uh, this is another piece of the story that i had completely forgotten that literally ba bible passages read out loud in this book 
yeah, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar, though I should have read um, these uh, actual passages before we the show, and I probably will after the. Actually, I certainly will after the show, but uh, the the subtle tweaks um, that added, um, you know, the demons to the uh, Bible stories were I, I I found really interesting and mm-hmm. bold from full from Pullman. Um, you know, there's, uh, there, you know, we, we, we chatted about this a little earlier today about, uh, some of the, uh, controversy in the larger world mm-hmm. about, uh, Pullman's, uh, approach to religion. And, um, you know, I, I can certainly see how some, some people may take this the wrong way. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, Looking at those passages, you know, we learned a long, we learned chapters and chapters and chapters ago that when demons finally settle on a form, it is a part, it is t- telling you a part of who you are. And, you know, and we, and we, and we had, you know, had to see the story of if you're not happy, if you don't like this form that your demon took, like you're going to have to learn t- to love or know that part of yourself because it's a part of who you are. Um, and so I love that that's what, you know, when, when Eve in our story takes the bite and they, they get the, the, the fruit from the tree of, of knowledge and they understand that they're naked and they see shame, they know, they see themselves as naked. I, I love, I love that the demon was a part of that. I think that was so, so cool that, that they saw their demons true form, whatever it was that they truly were. And that was what, you know, gaining that knowledge was what caused them to then at some point have to be expelled shuffled out yeah mm-hmm. um yeah it's it, it's really interesting and really striking um and altering a a text like that um a sacred text and altering it in that way is it's uh it's significant is a significant statement being made here uh but i i i really found that it still read like the bible reads uh, it wasn't so off-putting that it didn't still sound like the Bible. Right. And I think the the offense that you were talking about, Travis, is the, you know, it's it's obviously then it's about the in, the intent of these, of how these passages are being used and what they, what they're showing about religion. You know, I know that when we talk about Philip Pullman, we say, and I know that I've seen things that he said that he's not attacking faith, he's not attacking belief. Um, he's attacking this idea of like power and control Uh Um, and that he's not attacking a a, a particular religion. He's kind of doing like, you know, just any kind of time that power is used that way. But he's also very clearly using the Catholic church. And so I think that's a little, I mean, I I understand, um, you know, religion and faith are not, are two different things. Religion are the laws that you follow. It's being pharisaical. It's saying, if I do these things and follow things this way, I will get this result that I want. Faith is believing something and trying to work and move through that and have it work and move through your life. Those are two very different, Mm -hmm. very different things. So I believe him when he says he's not attacking faith. But I feel like religion is the exact thing he is attacking here because it's, that's what's being used for the power and control. Um, I'm not or, organized religion. Organized, yes, organize, religion. right? Organized religion that is, you know, and and then again, specifically using, you know, I mean, the Catholic Church here, it's very clear that's what, like, it's not this amalgam of like Buddhism and and you know Hinduism, and we're not looking at all these other. I mean, it's very clearly Catholicism here, so. You know, I can understand why people's maybe bristle bristled a little bit, um, but for me, part of what I think makes you what you know that's religion versus faith because I would need to be able to hear that and see this and process it, and it's either going to help me to make what I believe or uh, my faith stronger, or it's going to help me to question it. And if it's not right, I need to look at it again. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, and that's the, and that's the fear that they're talking. That's that's what they're afraid of. You and know, so, I won't. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, no, no, no. I don't have anything else. 
<laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say that uh, I wonder if he chose the, you know, the Catholic uh, trappings um, if, for the same reason that Tolkien did. Tolkien, um, you know, wrote Lord of the Rings to specifically for a Christian world, for an audience that was Christian, for an audience that was going to be, you know, well acquainted with, uh, you know, churches. And that's why when you read uh, anything in Lord of the Rings, there are no religions. Because he wanted to, because from his perspective, you know, we all got what religion should be. Religion should be this. And, you know, I, I, I wonder, you know, if he, you, if Pullman used the magisterium as shorthand, you know, the, the, the Catholic trappings for the magisterium as shorthand for religion, because that way we all, because, you know, it, it's the universal church. We all know what, that this is supposed to indicate religion to a Western audience. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. I, it's, yeah, this isn't going to be the last time that this kind of thing comes up in this trilogy. It's only the first time that we've really got to sink our teeth into it. Uh -huh. uh, but it's a, uh, it, it's it stood out. You know, this is like okay, we're leading up to this, like oh yeah, the church and the magisterium, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's like oh no, this, now it's real. Now we sort of we're being driven in a, in a certain way as readers. Uh -huh. And I did pull uh, the the relevant chapter from the Bible, and uh, the the changes is so subtle. All all the only change is that, uh, and your demon shall assume their true true forms. Everything else is word for word from uh, the, the 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 Bible, but uh, they, he just added that one little phrase and hmm. changed the entire thing. And we've been living in this world for hundreds of pages. It just slides right in it just yeah. rolls right off the tongue you know it's so natural you accept it mm -hmm. it's just kind of a, its own magic trick in a way mm -hmm. you know we i could probably have sat and read a whole new genesis at this point that he wrote and have been fascinated by it you oh, know yeah. uh which you know that would have been thrilling in its own way um so we get some of this and we talk about original sin and and um, this is when we hear a little bit of, more about Mrs. Coulter and Lord Asriel's agendas mm -hmm. and what they are up to and how those two agendas are different, only slightly, but they are different, uh, and how um, Mrs. Coulter sort of rose to power in a male-dominated world, mm -hmm. uh, finding her own avenue um, and consolidating power. Uh, doing something that I think nobody really wanted to do themselves, but were happy that she was willing to do it, and how that um, gave them some uh, plausible deniability if it all went south. Uh, what did you guys think of her, you know, how she ended up where she ended up and what she was up to? I mean, the fact that they say, you know, he says... Well, she started the way most women start through marriage. She tried through marriage to, you know, gain whatever control or that she wanted. And, and then obviously having married Mr. Coulter wasn't getting her what she wanted. She had her eyes on Lord Asriel, who was higher and had a little bit more whatever. They have their child. Um, and then, you know, she's able to use those things, you know, to move into that next level with the ablation board and with the magisterium to take over this thing. Um, because I don't think in the end she cares. It's not about her caring. Like he says in the book, she wants to say, you know, she wants to basically keep sin from falling on children. And I don't, that's not her motivation for this at all. Mm -hmm. You know, her, it, it's, just, it's, it's to be able to control because they talk about it. They talk about the control. Lord Asriel talks about um, like zombies in this, in this, um, in this world. I'm trying to think of if they, if they do it the same way, but like how, right? Like it, like somebody's yeah. out their demon, there's a world that they have zombies and 
they look like, like corpses. Oh. Yes, but they like, weren't they do whatever de- they're told. But yes. these weren't dead. We don't think that these people were dead. They were just right. they had been severed. Yeah. Yes. And right. they were just basically shuffling around life, similar to the kid, you know, the the kid, the, the kid that we saw, mm-hmm. um, and how that was, you know, terrifying in its own way. But uh, they were able to utilize it as an advantage and have a, a, a servant basically someone who would just do whatever they told them and shuffle around and do it without questioning anything right and that's what she wants that's, that's she how wants. she's going to continue to rise to power this is the best way that she can be and if she's the one that's initiating this and she's the one that gets it to come to fruition and gets it to be she's going to be the top dog under everybody else except like who you know i guess the actual magisterium or the actual you know people that are in control in the actual church Mm -hmm. but like otherwise she's going to be like top dog right right? and she wants that desperately right yeah and lord azrael has a really different although adjacent but different um he is very interested in the energy that's released he's very interested in the the other universe or the other universes as he mentions it um and talks about uh the coin flip you know it lands on heads and in another universe it lands on tails and everything extends beyond that point in its own in its own reality uh and that this city in the sky is somewhere that he believes is reachable and this release of energy seems to be an important and very important to him, more important than the intercision itself, than the release of energy and how that could be harnessed. Because Mrs. Coulter does not seem to be that interested in the energy that is released from this intercision. There are traveling parallel paths as to what is happening here with the oblation board, but they both have very different end game here. Yeah, my, my, my thing with uh, Lord Azrael is he reminds me of that guy who, who tells you, oh, I don't like this, you know, in, insert extreme politician here. He doesn't go far enough. <laughs> he, he literally says that about the oblation <laughs> board. He's like, oh, you know, I don't like what they're doing. They don't go far enough. They're, it's they're horrifying. slicing kids all, it's horrifying. off away from their souls. Yeah. But when he says, when he gets so fascinated with the energy, you know, my, my my first thought is, oh, he's going to cut some kid. Mm-hmm. He's 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 going to do some inter- intercisions himself and just absorb the power, mm-hmm. you know, because he's talking about uh, I, I want the I I want this energy. I want to go to this world. How else do I get this energy? I have to to cut somebody off from their demon. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a dead giveaway. Lord, yeah, I mean, Lord, yeah. Lyra says says straight up she doesn't um, she has concerns about his uh, his sanity and uh, mm-hmm. she's right. She is right. Well, yeah, and and she says to him, she's like, well, what about you? What were you doing all this time? Did you do any of the cutting? And you know what? He doesn't answer her. Nope. What he says is, I'm interested in something quite different. And that's when he says, oh, the ablation board didn't go far enough. He's like, deflect, deflect. He never answers because there's no other way for him to know that there's this huge surge of energy when you sever a demon from a child Mm -hmm. unless you were there and even if he wasn't the one that was doing the cutting, he was there, just like yeah. anybody in Bolvanger was there. This is and, his Sarah Huckabee Sanders moment. Yeah. Where he's like deflecting and, yep. you know, dodging and not really saying what really is happening. This is his moment to sort of like, he's sort of like, okay, he's, he's disingenuous. Yeah. I don't believe Absolutely. a word he says. Yeah. And then he says the thing that he knows will keep Lyra totally take her attention away he's like well it'll open up a portal to another universe Mm -hmm. and that's all he had to say and that's all she wants to know about now Mm -hmm. what do you mean and you know and so she totally loses sight of the fact that in order to do this it was the thing she you know literally went to save roger from Mm -hmm. the first time there and and go and go um you know get all the other children out and you know tony macarius all those things yeah all the things she's seen yeah anyway and and granted, it's fascinating and and exciting and mm-hmm. kind of mind blowing to hear that kind of thing, uh, but still, she loses a little bit of sight of the the, you know. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's it's understandable to me. She's seen the city. She knows what it looks like. She's seen it in the sky. I mean, this is a big deal. 
mm-hmm. you know if you know somebody tells me that oh i'm going to a, to another universe mm-hmm. in the midst of this other conversation my attention is probably going to be split too yeah mm-hmm. uh so i had um a couple things that jumped out at me that i wanted to humorously ask you number one is uh did you guys catch the name of the bear that yorick killed I did. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hjalmar Hjalmarsson. (laughs) It was Homer. (laughs) Just a great, just the best name. And, you know, just a tasty name that where else are you going to drop a name like that? That made me extremely happy. Uh, At least it wasn't like Hjalmar Simperson. Hjalmar (laughs) Hjalmarsson. (laughs) This poor guy. I picture it. I picture this bear as like diminutive. Just kind of a. Kind of a dork. He's got a he's got a pocket protector. An you know, yeah. You know, and, <laughs> An you know it, but the tragic part is he was he was full poor guy, the poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Yofor had the ultimate overbite when he lost his bottom jaw though. Hey yo. Hey yo. For real. Uh you know, the tragedy of it is that he was drugged. Yeah, full yes. out drugged. Yeah. Yes. Was, I felt so I, you know, I went from sort of like laughing at his name to like, oh, this poor guy, uh-huh. this poor bear was like so out of his element mm-hmm. and he ends up dying for it driving, you know, Yurik insane by, you know, being whatever on, on these drugs. And then, you know, it wasn't even his fault. And the drugs are supplied by none other than Mrs. Coulter. Yeah, of course. You know, she's oof, man, Mrs. Coulter. We, if ugh, I don't want to see her again. For real. Yeah, uh, the worst. I just uh, imagine that this drug with his name, like the drug, just made him go like, "I'm not touching you. I'm not touching <laughs> you. I'm not touching." And then York was fine, just like, "Oh my god, I'm touching it. you. Yes. You know, <laughs> I'm not touching you." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am killing Travis tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh, Say his name again, just one more time. <laughs> Hjalmar Hjalmarsson. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if there could be a nerdy polar bear, this is the guy. That's another shirt. We could have Hjalm- <laughs> Hjalmarsson. Some, ask Tiffany Deep. Deep. deep, have deep, deep uh, could she please draw him? Could she draw him? They, he could, could be like see. sitting in the front row of his class, like holding up his paw to answer a question. <laughs> And all the other bears around him just like shaking their head. And that's what set <laughs> York off. Yeah. Uh, you're just like, ah. Oh. He always raises his paw. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Poor bear. The worst. The worst. Uh, the worst. Did you, uh, <laughs> any other, any other stuff here? I, I, I wasn't, didn't know if we wanted to really go into the um, Castrati comparison to what the, eh, you know, we could leave that part out. Now, though, but, I'll tell you what I did like, though, was um, the comparison of Adam and Eve to math. Right. That was amazing. Right. That was interesting. Just, the, the, so the science. Of, for a sec. Yeah. Uh, but think of Adam and Eve like an imaginary number, like the square root of minus one. You can never see any concrete proof that it exists. But if you include it in your equations, you can calculate all manner of things that couldn't be imagined without it. Yeah. Yeah. That was incredible. Yeah, that's a that's quite the that's quite the statement. Oh my god. Yeah, fantastic stuff. It's like uh, it doesn't matter if they're real; it matters their effect is what matters. Mm-hmm. And that, that that was just kind of amazing to me because I I feel like that theme is going to play out throughout the series. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, that was that was something. That was definitely something. Yeah, Joanna. Anything else on your end? No, I I'm I was I'm dead because of that bear. <laughs> There's I have nothing credible to add anymore except jokes about that bear. So uh, now I'm going to now require both of you to say his name. Hilmer Hilmerson. That's pretty good. Pretty good, <laughs> Joanna. What do you got? I don't know how to. Is it Hjalmar Hjalmarsson? So good. 
I like yes. how both of our voices squeaked at the end of Helmerson. <laughs> does, does he sound like Urkel tonight? <laughs> 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 I'm useless. I'm so sorry. I'm useless. It's a, it's a good way to see. We started the episode early, and look what happens. <laughs> so we get we have a little more energy at the end. Oh my goodness! Oh, and you, all, all both of you are, are welcome for. Uh, I had had it all planned. I was going to play the Mortal Kombat theme at the beginning of the show, because so I had it queued up on my Spotify. I'm like, I want to play this, but then I realized we'll probably be sued. So uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Although this is a not for profit inter- enterprise, so maybe we get away from it. Get away with it. That's true. Who knows? Um, so we uh this has been terrific. And what's what is kind of shocking is that next week is our last two chapters of this book. I was like, <laughs> oh my god. And it's like they are diminutive chapters too. They are real small. Mm-hmm. We are gonna be done with this in a heartbeat. Like if I take this book on the train with me tomorrow, I'm gonna be done with it before I get to work. Um So chapters 22 and 23 next week. I'm tremendously excited about what's going to happen. But please do check us out on social media. We're on Facebook and we're on uh, Instagram. You can also find us on the web at www.theamberspycast.com. Please visit us there. And we would love it, love it. If you would email us at feedback at film, at, man, I keep saying film F- feedback at the amber because we want to hear from you, especially as we're finishing up this book. We'd love to talk a little bit more. I think if we, if I was going to guess, we'd probably read the last two chapters, talk about those and maybe do kind of a ultimate recap uh, leading into the next week, which maybe we can talk about that film that we've been discussing a little bit. 2007. Yeah, that on if, Amazon Prime. And yep, my free. kid asked me if we can watch it last night. She's like, isn't that your podcast? And I was like, yes, but I can't watch it yet. I have to wait yep. until it's time. You need to wait one more week. Name. Yeah, my yeah. kids watched it without me and I didn't watch it. Nice. Just so I didn't. Really? Just so I, let, I, I said, this is what mommy's podcast is. I mean, they're not too little, but. So yeah, my my two youngest watched it, um, but I was like, no. I have what to was wait. The, what was the reaction? What did they think um, of it? I think that my youngest, my nine year old, was kind of like, didn't quite get, didn't quite get it. My my twelve year old had some questions. I mm-hmm. think she had some um, continuity questions and. Yeah, there's some big ones in there. I yeah. can't, I, I'm sort of looking forward to talking about the movie too. So. Uh, so next week we'll do 2223 week uh-huh. after we'll do the 2007 movie. um Chris White's film uh The Golden Compass and we'll dive into that do a deep dive and uh that should be entertaining. And then after that we'll have some special shows with special guests and all kinds of fun things before we start the uh the TV series in the second book. Ooh the subtle knife I'm so excited. Yes. Uh, so appreciate everybody listening and uh, have a wonderful week you too guys bye bye Jamal Harmison signing off